It's my, really from my heart, my pleasure to introduce you to Michael John Gorman, who is the founding director of Biotopia. Who of you knows what Biotopia is? Nobody yet, but we will change this because it will be, who of you have heard about the Deutsches Museum in München? Aha, it's the, it was the museum of the 19th, 20th century. But the museum of the 21st centuries will be built in Munich within the next five days. And this young, these two, two, these two August and Michael John, are the leading figures behind it. And we agreed with DLD that we do, um, because I think it's so needed and it's, it's such a good idea, that we do t something together. And Auguste, my dear friend Auguste Bayern, brought together with Michael John a wonderful panel of amazing women. I'm so happy that you're here. I can't wait to listen to you. Thanks for coming. Michael John, please introduce your panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. <laughs> Thank you, Steffi. So it's such so wonderful to be here. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about Biotopia. Um, but our topic for today w is really the future of interspecies communication. Uh, and we have three world experts in this area with us today. So something completely different. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, we want to go beyond humans today. Um, so, um, first of all, I would like you to close your eyes and just listen to a sound and see if you can guess what the sound is. Can anyone guess what that was? Be really impressed. So that was the sound of somebody from the Yao people in Mozambique summoning a honey bird, a honey guide bird. And the honey guide bird is very, very good at finding bees nests inside hollow trees. But it's very bad at getting at the bees nests and getting, uh, uh, the, getting to what it really wants, which is the wax honeycomb in the bee's nest. It needs people to help it do that. So this is a, 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 a relationship that has endured for thousands of years. Some people say up to 100,000 years. Humans communicating with other species, uh, where the other species enlists the human's help to break open and smoke out the bees uh, so that it can get its wax and that the people get the honey. This is, so there's a deep history of humans communicating with other species. Um, and this is something which has been going on for millennia, but something which now uh, has a new future, which we're going to talk about today. So we're really going to be looking at how can new technologies help the relationship between humans and other species, help us to increase understanding and empathy uh, with other species and with our environment. We face enormous environmental challenges, and this is an area where we feel that uh, we can't, unfortunately, look to the US for leadership anymore. We actually need uh, leadership for coming from other parts of the world around environmental challenges. So this is something which, in creating Biotopia, uh, we, we want to create a new kind of forum for that. And we'll hear a bit more about that from Augusta. But first of all, what does the future of interspecies <laughs> communication look like? Uh, this is a rather curious device. Uh, it's, it's called the Coculus Rift. <laughs> it's uh, from a project called Second Livestock. <coughs> and so you have here a chicken. And the chicken is a battery chicken, but it thinks it's a free-range chicken uh, because it thinks it's roaming freely in beautiful fields and so on, but it's actually in a small, confined space. This is a provocative project by an artist called Austin Stewart, but I think it raises some interesting questions about how, uh, with technology, we could go uh, in terms of enhancing interspecies communication. Um, so, we... Let me see. Oh, yes. So, we are creating, uh, as Steffi mentioned, this new project and platform in Munich called Biotopia, which is really looking at the future of life. And it's a global project, 
headquartered in Munich. It's a platform for new kinds of con conversations and to create new types of connections between humans and environment. Um, it's in a very beautiful place, which is called Schloss Nymphenburg in Munich. Have any of you been to Schloss Nymphenburg? Wow, quite a few. <laughs> so, so we will be breathing a new kind of life into Schloss Nymphenburg. But I would like, first of all, to introduce Princess Augusta von Bayern. She's a princess and also a, a scientist who's an expert on parrot and crow intelligence. And she will tell us a little bit about Biotopia and will also introduce the theme of interspecies communication as one of our key themes. So over to you, Augusta. <clears throat> I'll say a bit more about Biotopia. It's more than just a life sciences museum in Bavaria. It will become the international forum and creative hub where today's environmental challenges are faced and tackled. And we are creating a network that includes the United States, so we are hoping to engage all of you. What caught my enthusiasm for Biotopia is that its potential positive impact in all sorts of positive directions. It is about reconnecting children with nature, about enthusing people for science, um, raising environmental awareness and, and um, fostering inter interdisciplinary discussions about questions that are vital for survival on this planet. Biotopia will be an eye-opener that encourages people to act by sh inciting shifts in perspective. The goal is that visitors leave with new ideas and an agenda to make changes in their lives uh, to make the world a better place. But Biotopia will be a museum about life. From the molecular to the organismal level, encompassing biodiversity, brain research, biodesign, all life sciences disciplines. As a worldwide unique concept, it will focus on behavior and use it as a vehicle to fascinate people for these disciplines. Learning ab about captivating behavior such as eat, um, forage, uh, eat, uh, reproduce, move, learn, and so on. It will teach people about biological principles in a playful way. But now to communication, um, the topic of our session today. We will, uh, it will be featured in the future Biotopia, and we will look at it um, we will look at the cognitive aspects of communication and give you a little taste of what Biotopia will look like. So, um, since ancient times and throughout all cultures, it has, it has been a dream of mankind to be able to converse with animals. There's the idea that one could just crack the code of all of the different animals' languages and then speak to them directly, um, just as Dr. Doolittle, who could speak the languages of all animals, and he could talk to snails as well as to monkeys. <laughs> of course, that's um, a very romantic and not a very realistic uh, dream. I very much hope that everybody here knows that animal communication is not about sh sharing um, very complex um, intellectual content, and that animal communication is non-verbal. But, um, and even, even if we could understand the language of lions, for example, would we understand what they're actually saying? Their thought processes might be very different to ours. But I think we all share, um, we all share the wish to understand of how complex communication can be, and let us now look at this with one caveat in mind. It is a deeply rooted human tendency to understand others at, as intentional agents, and we are interpreting that other, we are, um, uh, in our communications, characterized by, um, we, we know that we are communicating with the intention to change others' knowledge states and, and their thoughts. This is not necessarily the case in animals. In fact, as you can see here, lots of animal communication is passive, and the sender of a signal is not aware um, that it's impacting on a recipient, and the receiver is not thinking about the sender's intent. 
Um, but I'm a, work, uh, I'm a scientist working on animal intelligence, so of course I'm not going to tell you that all animal communication is very simple. In fact, there are some animal groups that are highly social, have large brains, and are very clever, and possibly they do have the capacity to, of intentional communication to some extent. But it's important to keep in mind that they can also be very simple principles. The great differences between human nonverbal communica between nonverbal communication systems and human language is that we can express almost anything in our words that can be endlessly combined, and we can refer to things that are distant in, in space and time. To some extent, there's evidence in animals that they understand grammar, they can relate to, to certain objects meaning to certain objects, they can, um, there's evidence that they can communicate intentionally and refer to objects that are not present. Irene is going to tell you more about that. Um, but let us now focus about the future of cross-species communication. I believe we first need to understand to what extent the communication systems of larger brained animals may exhibit components of human language. And for that, we need a systematic comparison um, of com communicative and cognitive abilities across species. I plan a big project doing exactly that with interlinks with Diane's and Irene's work, and I also speak about it because I'm hoping to find some technical support from you. Um, I believe one of the keys to identifying precursors or components of language in animals is to look at animals that can imitate sounds flexibly because plastic vocal learning is probably the most important prerequisite for the evolution of language, character, the most important characteristic of human language. Children develop, um, the, it's the phenomenon that children develop, learn an immense vocabulary in an incredibly short time, and that's solely dependent on their cultural background. And how this ability evolves is one of the greatest scientific mysteries. And I'm going to look that, at that in animals, whereas the majority of animals exhibit very rigid, genetically determined um, um, vocalizations. There's, like frogs, there's also parrots, crows, and, and, uh, parrots, crows, and dolphins that exhibit flexible vocal learning. And, yes. And um, it have never been compared directly. I'm planning to do that using touch screens like Diana. She will tell you more about that in a moment. And I would be very interested in talking to you if you can um, help with um, technologies about um, how one can um, categorize sounds automatically to distinguish between thousands of vocal repertoires of different species. I now pass on to Irene. Um, yeah. So just to introduce Irene very quickly. So Irene Pepperberg, thank you very much, Augusta. Irene Pepperberg, have it, any of you heard of the gray parrot, Alex the gray parrot, who was the genius of parrots? So Alex the gray parrot was Irene's parrot, and she's going to introduce us to uh, her work and the, on parrot communication. Thank you so much. So I'm going to start actually with a brief history of interspecies communication because I think we need to put it into context. And this started, I mean, who knows how long it started, but there's the apocryphal story of King Solomon who had a ring that allowed him to talk to all the animals. And if you look at most religious groups and much back history, you see these kinds of things. But scientifically, most of the work started with people like uh, Bill Thorpe in England, who was trying to crack the code of birdsong, and Jane Goodall, who was trying to study the animals in the wild, the chimpanzees in Gombe, and learn about what was going on. Um, one of the real breakthroughs was in the 60s, Trixie and Alan Gardner took a chimpanzee and trained it in American Sign Language. The animal was actually using a human language to communicate with humans to talk about things in its environment, to ask for things, to describe things it was seeing, not prompted, not for treats, but to communicate. This was an incredible breakthrough. And their work was really just the beginning. Um, they were followed by people who were working with orangutans, with 
other people doing different types of talks with gorillas, other people using different systems, like keyboards and plastic chips with other types of apes. In 1973, Conrad Lorenz, Nico Tinbergen, and von Frisch learned, got a Nobel Prize for their work on cracking codes, on interspecies communication, on trying to understand the communication of other animals. In 1976, Donald Griffin, a major breakthrough, he was so fascinated by this, he wrote a book called The a, a Question of Animal Awareness and argued that interspecies communication provided a window into the minds of these animals. It was a way that we could understand how they saw their world, how they interacted with their world. His work inspired people like Diana, myself, um, people, other people working on marine mammals to do more of this type of work. And we really, really got very far ahead on this. Griffin gave us a rationale for our studies. It was David Premack, whoever, however, who really looked into this and said, wait a minute, look at my research. I have shown that animals who have this symbolic communication actually process information about the world differently. They process it in a way that is much more human-like because they have this symbolic communication. So we were at this, this breakthrough period of an unparalleled you know, success in trying to figure out how animals saw their world. But um, basically, in 1980, in a room not too far from where we sit now, the same month of May, a conference at the New York Academy of Sciences came up arguing that all this work was really not important because animals were not using true human language. They weren't using exact human syntax. They weren't using it exactly the same way. The problem was, of course, this was the wrong question. It wasn't whether the animal can form a beautiful, complicated sentence of the type that I'm talking to you, using to talk to you, but rather whether they had symbolic communication, whether they can use abstract symbols to describe their world in all sorts of interesting ways the way we do. Combine them, maybe not syntactically the way we do, but still combine them to come up with novel descriptions of what was going on. And that led us to incredible breakthroughs in our understanding of animal cognitive processing. Okay, how do they think? One quick example, okay, so my parrot Alex, two chimpanzees, I and Sheba, were able to learn to use Arabic numerals to refer to exact sets of numbers. Now, almost any animal you look at knows one versus two versus three. But when you get up to four, five, and six, okay, it's very difficult. If I just went like this and you didn't know it was my fingers, you wouldn't know it was five, okay? So the point is, but they could do this. You give them any kinds of sets and they would tell you the exact numbers. Okay, Alex, then using his Arabic numerals, inferred the order of these numerals without any training. This is something no other non-human was able to do. Okay, he then learned seven and eight. He had learned one through six beforehand. He learned seven and eight without reference to the sets of objects, and then the first time inferred that they exactly represented seven and eight sets of things without any training. Without training. This is something that a parrot, separated from us by 300 million years of evolution, was able to do because he had symbolic communication. So where can we take this? Uh, we can do, and, and we're working in my lab now, we're trying, the three of us, to, to collaborate, to do additional types of tasks that are contingent on the symbolic representation. How do they see optical illusions? How do they literally see the world? We've shown that our birds see it the same way, even though their, their brains are organized incredibly differently. We're now working on a project on visual working memory, a very fancy version of the shell game, again, finding out that the birds see the world the way we do. We can use this to crack their natural code. In the wild, we're using automated playbacks, okay, and triggered recordings, and RFID tags and GPS to track where they are and what they're doing. Um, we need, what we really need, is additional technology so we could see the world the way that they do. Birds see in the ultraviolet. Dolphins hear above our frequencies. Elephants hear below our frequencies. We need to be able to understand that and have you translate this into what we as humans, with our very simplistic systems, can tell us, okay? There are other practical implications. We can make different types of, quote, toys. For the animals, they're toys, but for us, they can help us see how they are examining the world by the way they interact and play with these things. Okay, we need actual visual, you know, basically we need types of visual reality systems, okay, basically things like the Oculus 
to see how they see the world, to help us understand their experiences, and the possibility with some of these animals to be able to Skype together. Gray parrots are sighted one, okay? They're completely uh, endangered. We need to be able to track them, which we can do with technology. Um, and basically, we're just limited, okay, by our imagination and what we could do using your technologies to help us crack their codes and work with us. So I want to live this for you to think about, and thank you very much for listening. So we're all out of time. Alas, we've run out of time, but I would just like to say thank you to the panelists, and if you'd like to talk to a dolphin or to get involved with Biotopia, please come and talk to us over lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you all.